have God's Word with you, and I trust that you do, we'll go to Esther chapter 1 tonight. Book of Esther, chapter number 1. My plan is to wrap up our examination of the troublous times of the second installment this evening. Been in uh, this section of the timeline for a few weeks now. This is our uh, fourth part to the sub-series of messages we're calling Troublous Times, of course, within the larger study, Israel, My Glory. And uh, the second installment, of course, we're talking about the second installment of this fifth course of punishment here that began with the captivities. We've looked at some of those things at this point, and uh, we're dealing really in this uh, second installment uh, with the 49-year period that Daniel outlined as the first part of that in which there was going to be some uh, return of Jews to the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem in particular, uh, rebuilding and reconstruction work of the temple and then eventually of the city. And I uh, looked at a number of those things already, and we have associated three historical books with this period of the timeline, and we know what those are at this point. We've got them marked up here. It's Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther that fit in with that time. And then, of course, the writing prophets, we have three of those as well. They're at the, the very end of the section of the prophets, which is Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And uh, really up to this point, we've spent the majority of our time in this second installment in the book of Ezra. Um, we did get into some of the early chapters of Nehemiah last week, for those of you um, that were here and those that uh, tuned in. Got into some of the early chapters of Nehemiah and saw some things there in connection with uh, the wall of the city of Jerusalem and how Nehemiah returned there to take the work onto its completion and to have those um, the wall rebuilt and, and so forth. We saw that they, they did that. And uh, in preparation for this week, I was contemplating going back into Nehemiah and hitting on a few other things just because there is uh, a good bit more detail in Nehemiah than what we covered last time. But as I, I thought on that and kind of read through that this week, I, I made the decision that, you know, I think we've hit enough in Nehemiah there to get the, the main point that we want to look at there with the reconstruction of the, the wall and his role in connection with that. And so uh, with that being the decision, decided to go on and move into Esther, which is the third book that goes with this second installment. And uh, what we're going to do tonight basically is just try to get a, a, a general sense of what the book of Esther is all about and uh, kind of how it fits on the timeline, some of the details and the relationship that it has to some of the things that we've looked at already. And so we'll be reading um, through a good bit of this, uh, this book. Uh, we'll skip around a little bit, but uh, our, we are going to have to read a number of verses. And um, I think it's uh, as we read the verses, the commentary probably can be uh, held in a little bit tighter and not so much expounding necessary because it's, it's pretty clear most of the time what's being talked about here. So we want to do that. And as we come to the book of Esther, just as a few introductory comments, Esther, uh, it's a little bit unique in the scripture and in this section uh, for a number of different reasons. One of the most obvious features of uniqueness would be the fact, of course, that the, the name of the book is named after a woman, right? That's pretty unique. Uh, up to this point, we, of course, would come into Ruth, there's another woman that a book was named after. And now again we have Esther. But that, that you know, is definitely something that stands out as being unique. There have been a number of books that have been named after men. And you continue to see that throughout God's Word. And so books that are named after women is very unique. And Esther is one of those unique books for that reason. It's bearing the name of a female. And um, Ruth and Esther is the only two books that's named after women. Another unique feature of the book is that the name of God never occurs. That's, that's a fascinating thing, isn't it? That's definitely unique to Scripture. You start looking at the other books of Scripture. To my knowledge, I think it's the only one where that's the case. Right? Now, that's not to say that God is not present with his people in the events that Esther's talking about. Mm -hmm. It's very obvious that he is. God is all over it. But his name, by name, he's not mentioned. It's, it's almost like his work is in the background when you come to Esther. And so that's a, a unique feature uh, to the scripture that we find here in the book of Esther. And then the other feature of uniqueness, specifically as it relates to our second installment, is that the setting of this book, while it's time-wise belonging to this period of the second installment, the events that it's going to describe 
are not set primarily, or really at all, as the other books were, back in the promised land. All right, we've seen some things taking place in Persia or Shushan the palace and that referenced in Ezra and Nehemiah, but the, the thrust of what those books were talking about had its focus on when they get back into the city of Jerusalem and the work that they were doing in connection with the, either the temple or the, the wall or the city and so forth. And so the majority of the focus of those works was back in the land, okay, and that returning remnant. When you come to Esther, the setting is not back in the land of Israel. You're actually in Persia, and the Jews that he's going to be talking about and that this book is talking about is are, are those Jews that are still there in the land of their captivity, Jews that have not gone back and made the trip to Jerusalem. And so that's, that's a unique feature in that uh, it's talking about things outside of the land. We're going to start here in Esther chapter number one, and as we do, we're going to read some verses here, and we're going to be greeted right off the bat with a Persian king that's on the throne at this time, and he's going to have the given name Ahasuerus here in the scripture. Ahasuerus is the king of Persia at this time. Now, by most historical dating, it's believed that Ahasuerus is the Xerxes of secular history. Right? So if you go to a secular history book about the Persian kings, there's a king that's known by the name of Xerxes in those works. And most people that have done the comparisons and look at the things that are described about it have come to the conclusion that the Ahasuerus that's mentioned here in Esther chapter 1 is the Xerxes of history, right? secular history. And Ahasuerus is, uh, it's most likely that Ahasuerus is a, a title for the Persian kings. Uh, it's a reference to the kings, or it's possibly it could be an alternate name for Xerxes, if that is indeed the person that we're, we're talking about. And I have no reason to, to doubt uh, that conclusion of uh, other studied men of history. And so if that's true that Ahasuerus is Xerxes, then what that means time-wise is that we're in a setting here in the book of Esther that actually precedes this second return of Jews that we talked about last week under Ezra and later Nehemiah. You remember the king that we were dealing with, with Ezra's return and Nehemiah's return last time was uh, Artaxerxes. Okay? And we saw him with both, again, with both with uh, Ezra and Nehemiah on the throne. Xerxes or Ahasuerus was the father of Artaxerxes. Okay? So what that means is that that is indeed the right person, that the, the contents of the book of Esther chronologically come before Ezra returns back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the wall, okay? So we're, we're backing up chronologically even though we're moving forward in the Bible, okay? Now that's, that's an important point to me, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but it, it kind of helps you to, to place in your mind the events that we're about to read, okay? So Ezra and Nehemiah have not gone back to the land yet. There has been a first group of Jews that had returned years earlier under Zerubbabel for the reconstruction of the temple, They've gone back into the land. They're in Jerusalem. But this group here has not. And before that, you've got the contents of the book of Esther. Okay? And with that in mind, let's look here in uh, chapter 1 and picking up in verse 1. We'll get into the narrative itself. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is uh, Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days, a hundred and eighty day Feast or party, right? We're talking, what, six months? All right, that's, that's some feasting that they're doing there, isn't it? All right, he's showing all the glory of his kingdom. Verse 5. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple uh, to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon the pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. 
And they gave them drink in the vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded uh, Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zether, and Carsus, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him. So you're following, you're following the narrative here. I think it's fairly clear what's going on. They're having these feastings and there's a point in time where the king is calling for the queen to come into the palace where they're having this, this party. All right? Vashti is her name. And as she, he gives commandments to bring her in and to to come in with the crown royal to show her beauty, we see that Vashti rebels against the commandment of the king. I'm not coming. Right? She says no. And as you can imagine, telling the king no oftentimes stirs him up to wrath. Right? So he, predictably, he gets mad about it. He's, He's fired up about it. And so as you read on down through the chapter here, you'll see that he's telling his servants to search the law and he wants to make search as to what can legally be done to Vashti as a result of this rebellion against the king's commandment. What what can we do according to the law? And so his servants made search and they come back with a, a proposition for what he's to do. If you skip down to verse 19 now, they're speaking. They say, if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give their husbands honor, both the great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mimikin. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces and to every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language that every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Right? So they're, they're, they're essentially suggesting that he remove the crown from Vashti, right? She's to be banished from the king's presence, excommunicated, to come no more. You're going to strip her of the crown and the, that, that, uh, queen designation that she has, and you're going to give that to another, essentially, is what they're going to say. Okay? All right, so that pleases the king. He has the commandment written up. It's gone and it's published throughout the quarters of his kingdom. Vashti's removed out of the way, and there's a vacancy now in the the office or the throne of the queen that they're preparing to, to fill, okay? And so we move on into chapter number two. That was the beginning of women's liberation. Something like that. All right, chapter 2, verse 1 now. He says, And after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. All right, now we're moving ahead a little bit here. She's been removed and the command has been given. She's been banished. And they've had to have a space of time to go and publish this proclamation. And a little later on, down about verse 16 of this chapter, you'll you'll see as you measure that, with um, it'll talk about being the seventh year of Ahasuerus. Comparing that to the events of chapter 1, which was in the third year, you can see that there's about three or four years here that have passed as the proclamation's been published and as the king's wrath is being appeased here. So a number of years have gone by where the, the queen's throne has been vacant. It hadn't been filled yet. Okay, And so the king of Hazarus is remembering this and what, she, what Vashti had done and what was decreed against her. Verse 2 Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the province of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of uh, Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. 
And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. All right, so after three or four years from Vashti's removal now, they're gathering together, as the Bible calls it, the fair young virgins from the quarters of the kingdom, which is an expansive kingdom at this point, collecting these women, bringing them in to Shushan the palace before the king for the purpose of him deciding who's going to be set as the next queen. All right, so you've got all these women being together together under the house here, giving their things for purification that we'll see here a little later in, in chapter 2. And uh, that's, that's what's going on now. And as that, that setting has been described, and you get to verse 5, you're going to be introduced to a couple of Jews now that are coming into the narrative of Esther that's going to be the focus of what the book is dealing with from this point forward. Okay? So we get introduced to these Jews. The first, in verse 5, he says, Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. All right, so we've got the introduction to the first Jew. There's a certain Jew that goes by the name of Mordecai. And we're told some things about him and his lineage. We're told that Mordecai is of which tribe? Benjamin, right? Okay, and he had been taken from Jerusalem in Jeconiah's captivity, back at the first, right? And, and it, so we understand that Mordecai is a man of the southern kingdom, right? You remember we had the division of the kingdom here. The northern ten tribes was known as Israel. The southern two were known as Judah. And those southern two would be Judah and Benjamin, known collectively as the kingdom of Judah. They've gone through time, and now Mordecai is one that has been taken out by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon earlier on from Jerusalem and taken over into Babylon and what's now Shushan, the palace of Persia, right? So this is a Jew of the captivity from Jeconiah's day, right? And that, that Jeconiah's captivity that he references there, that's talking about the, uh, I guess, what we would call the first wave of Nebuchadnezzar when he came in. There were two waves. Um, this is it's not the one where the, the temple was burnt and destroyed. That happened about 11 years after this fact. But in the first wave of captivity, Jeconiah's captivity, Mordecai had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians, right? And all these years have passed, right? Because we're past Babylon now. We're on into media Persia a good ways. And so there's been a whole number of years that this Jew has lived his life in captivity under dominion of both the Babylonians and now the Medo-Persians. I'd imagine that he was a, probably a pretty young man back when Jeconiah was carried out of the land and he went with them, right? And so the majority of his life, no doubt, he's been living in captivity under these Gentiles. That's where he's been, okay? And so a Jew of Benjamin who has lived his life in captivity, okay? Now, the second Jew that were uh, mentioned here is re a relation to him, verse 7 there. He says, and he, speaking of Mordecai, brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. All right, so right there, you probably maybe are learning something you didn't know. Esther, uh, I take it as her Hebrew name was actually Hadassah, or Hadassah, however you want to pronounce that. And she, was, she had a given name, which I take to be Persian in nature, of Esther. Right? And we know Esther because that's the book, the book title. But as far as the Hebrew part of it goes, her name was Hadassah. That is Esther. And we learned that she was an orphan. Right? She was an orphan Jewish girl. Father and mother had passed away. And Mordecai, her cousin, had taken her at some point as his own daughter. And he had brought her up. He raised her. Okay. I don't know what the events were surrounding her parents' death. You know, maybe it had to do with the, the siege. Maybe it was later on once they were already in captivity. But whatever the case, her parents had died. They left her behind. And Mordecai had taken her to himself, his cousin, and he had brought her up, raised her, been the father to her. And uh, we're, we're told here that she's uh, fair and beautiful. And um, she's essentially the adopted daughter of Mordecai. And so it happens, as verse number 8 is going to describe, that as the king is having these fair young virgins gathered from 
out of his kingdom. Of course, he's conquered a, you know, a variety of peoples. They're taking these, these women and these, these virgins from all over that Esther is taken with them. And so verse 8 says, So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his degree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Hege, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Hege, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with uh, such things as belonged to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. So the servant is taking note of Esther and her beauty and promoting her. Verse 10, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. All right. So you can see she's being taken up in this gathering of the virgin. She's there in the house. She's been promoted and she's going to have her opportunity to go in before the king. And Mordecai, of course, has that father figure. He's going by where she's at to see what's, you know, what's going to become of this, this girl that I, I love, my family member, my adopted daughter. And so he's, He's doing that there. And then as you skip down to verse 15, she has her opportunity where she's actually going in before the king now. And we pick up in verse 15 where he says, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, uh, who had taken her to his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Hege the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken under the king of Hazarus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Right? So there's our reference to the seventh year. Verse 17, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all the princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. All right, so you can see she's taken in. She pleases the king, and he has actually made Esther to be the queen in Vashti's room, okay? Now that's pretty straightforward as far as what's going on there. But you notice two times now the scripture has pointed out that she has not showed her people or her kindred. In other words, she hasn't made it known that she's a Jew or a Jewess, okay? Mordecai told her, don't reveal that. But she's set on the throne. And so that's, that's not made known at this point, okay? Now, interesting event happens here at the end of chapter 2, verse 21. He says, In those days, while Mordecai sat at the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bichthon and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king of Hazarus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name, and when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Right? Interesting three verses there that these chamberlains have basically come up with an assassination plot against the king. Right? There's some turmoil there. They're looking to overthrow the king. Mordecai comes into this intelligence some way or another. Sends to Esther. She sends the information to the king, certifies it in Mordecai's name. They look after it, find it to be so, and execute these that are plotting against the king. And a record is made of it in the Chronicles of the King. Okay, now that's that's an important detail that comes up a little bit later. Right? Just keep it documented in the back of your mind at this point. Okay? It's important information. Now, chapter three we get introduced to another key figure in this narrative, and that is the man Haman. Chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, 
and advanced him and uh, set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Right? He just executed some people that were holding positions close to the king. There's a promotion that's needed, and Haman obviously is one that the king finds favor in, and he promotes him. And he puts him above the princes that were with him. Verse 2, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Okay, now we've got the promotion of Haman here to a chief seat by Ahasuerus. We're told that the king has given commandment concerning this Haman in his new role, that in the king's gate, as he's passing by, the people are to bow unto him, okay? Do him uh, reverence, as the scripture says. And Mordecai is dwelling there in the gate of the palace. And we're told that Mordecai is refusing to comply with that commandment. Right? He will not bow. Ain't happening. It's Mordecai's attitude. Okay? And they're coming along and they're, they're seeing this. He's obviously standing his ground. Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? And they're, they're questioning this day after day after day. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And they, they're taking it to Haman. The reason that Mordecai is giving is, is there at the end of verse 4. For he had told them that he was a Jew. See? That's his answer to their question. Why aren't you... Why are you transgressing the king's commandment and not bowing? I'm a Jew. Now you say, well, what, what's that got to do with anything? Mm. Right? What does that have to do with anything? Is Mordecai just being hard to get along with there? Well, I think the key to that understanding is, is in who Haman is and the way that he's described. Verse 1 describes him and introduces him as Haman, the son of Hamadatha. It says, the Agagite. The Agagite. Now, Agagite is a description that tells you that he's a descendant of Agag. Right? A descendant of Agag. And Agag was an Amalekite. Right? So as an Agagite, he's an Amalekite. Haman is an Amalekite. Okay? Now, if you've got a sharp memory, and I realize it's been a while, but all the way back here, when Israel was brought out of Egyptian bondage and crossed the Red Sea, and they're out there in the wilderness, the Lord had brought them out of that bondage. You remember that out there in the wilderness, in Exodus chapter 17, Amalek, right, the Amalekites, was the first nation that came out in opposition to the nation God's just delivered out of Egypt. He's told them, I'm taking you out of this bondage and I'm taking you to a land. I'm going to establish you there and my purpose with you in the land. And God's purpose with Israel is, is beginning to move forward toward the land. And as they get out of Egyptian bondage, the first nation that they face in satanic opposition against the purpose of God with them was the Amalekites. They came and they, they smote the, the weakest of them in the hinder parts, right? They came as, as cowards there. And, and Joshua's got to go out and they had to fight the Amalekites there in the wilderness. And in connection with that whole event, you remember, that's where the name Jehovah Nissi had been given. The Lord, our victory banner, you see. Moses had held up his hands with the, the rod of God, right? And they prevail while his hands are up. And the Amalekites prevail when his hands are down and... God had wrought a victory there, but in connection with that event and that, that first nation that came out in satanic opposition to his people and his purpose on earth there in the wilderness, God had revealed the name Jehovah Nissi, and he said back there in Exodus 17 that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Lord will have war with Amalek, you see. Now, Mordecai no doubt knows his Jewish history. He knows Exodus chapter 17. 
and what the Lord had said. He knows the name Jehovah Nissi, so that when Haman come along, and it's Haman the Agagite, who he understands is an Amalekite, and they're saying, you got to bow, hey, or Mordecai rather, he's saying, no, I will not bow. Why? Because I'm a Jew, right? We're not bowing to the Amalekites, you see. So he won't do it. They bring the matter to Haman. And Haman, when he learns that he's a Jew, mm. predictably, immediately responds in a similar manner to really what's illustrated back here and what you'd say. He starts formulating a plan of opposition. The ancient conflict is still alive and well, right? And you see it illustrated here. You look at verse 5. He says, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. See, he's not happy punishing Mordecai by himself. He said, For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. They told him he was a Jew, because that's what he told them. Wherefore, right? Because of that, when he learns that he's a Jew, he says, he sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month uh, Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. All right, so he's stirred with wrath and indignation over Mordecai not bowing, but he's not just wanting to execute wrath and judgment upon Mordecai for not bowing when he learns he's a Jew and why he's not bowing, that, that ancient conflict comes back up and he's ready to destroy all of them. I want to get rid and purge Persia of all these Jews. All right, kill them all. Old and young. Yeah. The, the ancient conflict still alive and well there. Verse 8. It says, And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it unto the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from off his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. Notice that. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, in the name of king Ahasuerus it, uh, was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, and one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is in the month of Dar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment be given in every province, was published unto all people, that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. All right, so there's a plot of Haman now to have the Jews destroyed. He has gone to the king. He has secured the king's ring. He's going to seal the commandment in the king's name, which according to the laws of the Medes and Persians cannot be altered. All right, there's a day appointed, right, the 13th day of the 12th month, when it's basically going to be a free-for-all on the Jews throughout the kingdom. Kill them all. You can have their stuff. Okay, that's essentially what they've arranged. They've sealed it with the king's ring and with his name. Can't be altered. For all intents and purposes, the Jews' fate is sealed by the king's decree here and at the plot of Haman. Okay, and that's what's taking place. Notice verse uh, 1 of chapter 4. It says, And when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry, and came and even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate, uh, clothed with sackcloth, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning 
among the Jews and fasting and weeping, wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and took it uh, and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther uh, for uh, Haddock, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. Okay, so Mordecai's got the news. All Jews are going to be destroyed. He's in sackcloth in the king's gate. Word of this gets back to Esther. You know, she's trying to send him close, get him up out of the, the gate, you know, his mourning, and trying to address the issue, and he won't receive it. So she's got her messenger here, and, and they're communicating with Mordecai. And as you, you read on what, what goes on here in chapter 4, essentially the word comes back that the commandment has been given that all Jews should be destroyed. And Mordecai says, you know, Esther, it, it's, it's crunch time for you. You've got to go in before the king and speak to the king about this issue. Because, you know, your people are going to be destroyed here. And, of course, she's fearful of that. She'll, she'll answer back to him and say, you, know, you can't come into the presence of the king. There, there's one law for the person that enters the king's presence who's not been called for, and that is that they die. Except he hold out the golden scepter, you go into the king's presence uncalled for, you die. He said, she'll say, I haven't been called for 30 days. I haven't had, even had an opportunity to go in before him. And Mordecai will say to her, he'll say, Listen, don't think that you're any safer in the palace than all these Jews out here scattered among the kingdom. If this commandment is enacted, you'll be slain in the, in the palace just as well as those Jews outside. So you're going to die either way. If you don't do this, God will raise up deliverance for the Jews, he'll say, from another place, but your house is going to perish. And so she ends up hearkening to Mordecai. And you'll see there at the end of the chapter... After he said all this, verse 15, then answer, uh, Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat, uh, eat nor drink three days, uh, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will I go in unto the king which is not according to the law and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had said unto him. All right, so... She's got her plan. There's going to be a three days of fasting and prayer and so forth. And then she's going to go in, take her life into her hands before the king, speak to him. And so we continue chapter five, verse one. It says, now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on the royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And so Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given to thee to the half of the kingdom. All right, so after three days, she goes into the king. He raises the golden scepter. Her life's not going to be taken. And in his favor, he says, Make a request and I'll give you whatever you want up to half the kingdom. Okay, what does she do? Well, you read on. What she does is she asks the king to come to a banquet that she's prepared. And not only the king, Ahasuerus, but she says, Ahasuerus and Haman. I want Ahasuerus and Haman to come into my banquet. And of course, they oblige. The next day, they go into the banquet that she's prepared, and the king asks her the same question. What's your request? I'll give it to you up to half the kingdom. And what does she do? She says, I'd have Ahasuerus and Haman come to another banquet tomorrow. Okay? So they agree. All right, we'll come back tomorrow and ask you what your request is. So they agree to that. And you can kind of see what Haman's thinking at this point. Right? He's the only one beside the queen that's been asked to the queen's banquet. And verse 9 says, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. Right? <laughs> he thinks he's top dog. I'm the only one with the king going to the queen's banquet. Verse 9, he says, But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends 
and Zeresh his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and the servants of the king. He's just bragging about himself, how glorious he is. Verse 12, Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared, but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh his wife and all the, uh, his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet, and the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Right? He's talking about all this glory, but it's no good to me if the Jew is not bowing to me. And so they come up with the plan, all right, you're so in favor with the king, you can go in, you can ask him for whatever you want, just deal with this, right? Ask for Mordecai's life, have the gallows built and ready, and have the king hang him on the gallows, and then you can go into your banquet and just enjoy yourself. Go merrily, as it says, right? That, that, that sounds like a plan. Haman's on board with that. But then chapter 6, it says, On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Right? Your bedtime reading. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay a hand on the king of Hazarus. All right, that's what we read earlier. Was that chapter 2? It was written in the book of the Chronicles. That's what's being read to the king of this night where he can't sleep. Mordecai has spared the king's life. He saved the king's life with this information he's passed on. And so, verse 3, the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? And then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Passed over it. Nothing had happened. Verse 4, the king, um, and the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outer court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. He's coming to the king to ask for Mordecai's life. The king is looking for how to do Mordecai honor for sparing his life. Right? Verse 5, and the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? What should be done for somebody the king wants to honor? He says, Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? All right, so he's going to tell him what he wants to be done for him. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighted to honor, let royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let his apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal, whom the king delighted to honor, and bring him on horseback throughout the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. Dress him up in the king's apparel, put him in the king's chariot, send him out into the streets and put your highest noble before him, proclaiming to everybody, this is the guy that the king honors the most. Verse 10, then the king said to Haman, make haste and take the apparel and the horse that thou hast said and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. So Haman's got to go and get Mordecai and do all this honor to him. And he's the one that's leading it around the town. To honor, this is the man whom the king honors. You skip on down, you see uh, verse 12. It says that Mordecai came to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to the house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. All right? Maybe that idea you had, you know, we gave you wasn't such a good idea. You go talk to the king about this guy, you're not going to prevail. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlain and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet of Esther uh, that Esther had prepared. Right? It's time for this second day of banqueting, so they're bringing him to the queen's banquet. 
All right? So that brings us now to verse 7. After he's been publicly humiliated, having to honor Mordecai, chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee, and what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. Right? I want my life to be spared and I want the life of my people to be spared. She says, verse 4, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen, and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. If it wasn't an issue of death, I wouldn't even ask you this. It's like, we've been determined to be destroyed. Verse 5, then King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther, the queen, Who is he, and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? Whose idea is that? Right? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. Right? He's in a fury. He walks out of the banqueting room, goes out into the palace of the garden, and Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. So he's, he's begging for his life from Esther while the king's going out of the room and now, verse 8, the king's coming back. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the palace of the banquet of wine, right, where Esther and Haman are currently. It says, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. The king comes back in and he sees Esther on the bed and Haman's on the bed there. He's been begging for his life, but he's on the bed with her. And he says, will he force the queen also before me in the house? Say that. As the word went out of, his, of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbon, uh, uh, Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that they had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. And so Haman ends up hanging on his own gallows that he had prepared. Right? Ends up destroyed. The Jew prevailed over the Amalekite. All right? Now, the sequence is going to go on here. You've got chapters 8, 9, and 10. And essentially, what you've got in chapter 8 and, and some of chapter 9 there is uh, Esther has to go back into the king because there's already been a, a commandment earlier on that has been sealed with the king's ring in the king's name. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, it can't be altered. On the 13th day of the 12th month, it's a free-for-all in the Jews of the kingdom. Right? These people can slay them basically with no consequence. That, that can't be reversed. But what's going to be done? So she has to go in before the king, and essentially the, the, what he works out there is he issues another commandment basically that's sanctioning the, the Jews defending themselves. Right? They're not going to be held accountable for, for that. And so there, there's a, a whole series of events that are described here. But essentially, the, the bottom line of it all is through this series of events, the Jews prevail over their enemies, and the evil that was determined against them does not prevail. They're not destroyed. Okay, And Esther, uh, through this, is, is brought to the, the throne for this time to see the people spared. And, and you've got uh, the establishment of the Feast of Purim there at the uh, end of chapter 9. Mordecai ultimately is promoted uh, to a place of authority in Ahasuerus' kingdom, and of course the, the Jews prevail. Now that's the narrative of Esther. That, that narrative is fascinating, isn't it? Right, just the details of that alone is enough to thrill the mind, to, to read through it, and to see it confined to the, the individual circumstances and set of events that's going on there in Persia with Esther and Mordecai and all those types of details. But when you kind of you step back and you you look at all that, where it's placed, like you know where we said at the beginning, if this Hazarus is Xerxes, the father of Artaxerxes, and the placement of these events is coming prior to the return of Ezra and Nehemiah for the rebuilding of the city, 
If you think about it, if, if this plan of Haman had been allowed to go through and all the Jews had been wiped out there, according to the way he had devised it, what could not have happened? Right? That's happening before this. Ezra and Nehemiah and that band of Jews never would have been able to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the wall. And if Ezra and Nehemiah don't go back at the king's commandment to rebuild the wall... According to Daniel chapter 9, that's the event that would start the clock ticking of these 70 weeks. So if they can't go back, the 70 weeks never start. If the 70 weeks never start, Messiah the Prince can never come. If Messiah the Prince never comes, he won't be cut off, not for himself, to deal with the redemption issue of Israel and the, the, the predicament that they've gotten themselves into and another satanic bondage and, and, uh, and bondage to their sin and deal with that. And if their redemption is not carried out and Messiah does not come to implement Jehovah's name on their behalf, what also can't happen is the restoration of the Davidic kingdom out there at the end and the purpose of God that we started with back here for the earth that he had declared and vested in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this narrative, while it's fascinating in and of itself, you can see there's a spiritual conflict in this that has far-reaching consequences in the program all the way out to the end. This is a satanic opposition. Opposition to God's purpose on the earth. Stop the, you know, take the domino out, as it were, the, the missing piece so that it can't go on to... It's completion, as God has said. He's looking to break the word of God. So all that to say, it fits into a larger spiritual conflict, like the overarching conflict that we've been looking at all on the same conflict back here in Genesis 3.15, the same enmity, the same struggle, spiritual struggle is at work with the Jews' enemies here in Persia. And God is preserving them, isn't he? Even in all their rebellion, all of their sin and transgression. The reason they're in Persia to start with is because of transgressions of the law. And nevertheless, God is watching over them. He's preserving them and making sure that they're not destroyed. Fascinating detail, isn't it? Yeah. To look at a connection with the big piece. If God had not done it, even though he's not named, by, by name, you never see him at work. He's there preserving his word preserving his program, preserving his purpose, and he does what's necessary to see it to completion. Amen. You're one that's happening. She has to, she got chosen to be the king's wife. But there's a lot of women, a lot of young girls there that he could have picked, but she was there for such a time. Such a time as this. Amen. 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 So fascinating story. I hope that's been enlightening to you and just to see it fit in there and kind of how it slides right in to the overall narrative of the program. It's an amazing thing. We marvel at God's word. Amen. I hope that's been a help to you tonight. We'll close in prayer. Our God and Father, we are grateful for the time tonight. We pray that these thoughts that have been shared here at the book of Esther have been uh, for the, the saints' edification, an understanding of your word, and uh, this is a greater appreciation for these things that have been developed in their hearts and minds, and that uh, we'd be able to use these things as we move ahead to build upon them and just uh, see the glory of your word and the glory of your son to whom the word testifies. We give you the thanks and the praise in Christ's name. Amen.